Thank you so much, Mark. I'm really excited that um, maybe some of the people that have tuned in in the past can actually see what I look like. And it's nice to sort of feel like we're part of a little community here. Um, and so I'm really glad to have two excellent speakers with us today. Um, we're trying out some new software, like Mark said, so thank you for your patience. Um, Dr. Tara Ball is going to speak first. She's a research assistant professor at Michigan Technical University in Houghton, Michigan. She's going to be discussing maple dieback and decline in Michigan, and she's going to talk about how her findings have encouraged different approaches to forest management in the face of maple decline. And following Tara, we're going to have um, Dr. Kevin Krasnow, a research and graduate faculty member with the Teton Science Schools. Kevin is a disturbance ecologist, and he's going to be discussing evolving paradigms of aspen ecology and management in the West. So again, thank you for joining us. Thank you to Tara and Kevin, and I'm going to turn it over to them. So again, we're using new software. Thank you for your patience, but I think everything seems to be working really well today, so um, we're off to a good start. Um, so today, as Megan said, I'm going to be talking about um, the work that I did looking at sugar maple dieback and decline in Michigan. This was all part of my um, PhD research. So to kind of start out with and give everybody an idea of where I am, this is a nice satellite photo of Lake Superior in the fall. You can kind of start to see some nice orange colors uh, to the south of the lake a little bit as the fall colors come out. Those are all maple trees, so it's a really high density of sugar maple in this region. Um, where I'm sitting right now giving this talk is right in that little part sticking up into Lake Superior here is Houghton, Michigan. Um, hopefully somebody's familiar with that location. Uh, this is a nice image to kind of look at and think about in the Great Lakes, but really what we look like most of the year is kind of like this. And um, the Great Lakes area, as most people know, are pretty famous for their lake effect snow. And especially in the Upper Peninsula, we get a lot of um, deep snow that stays on the ground for many months of the year. Um, up until There's still snow around in my yard at home, um, all the way around the lakes. There's um, quite a bit of snow, actually, still, even though we had close to 80 degree um, eight degrees over the weekend. Uh, what, if you're looking at the whole Great Lakes area, so this is all five of them here, the region that the study focused on and that we were particularly interested in was the sort of western upper Great Lakes region. So it sounds like a mouthful to refer to, but it's uh, important because sugar maple is spread all the way across this whole region in the Northeast, as most people are familiar with, and most of the research looking at sugar maple health has been done in its eastern range. So more um, Quebec and Pennsylvania and New York, and very little of it has done anything on this side of Lake Michigan, um, especially this far north. So we were looking at the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, northern Wisconsin, eastern Minnesota, right there along the lake edge. And some people question why sugar maple dieback is on the radar. It's not um, something that sugar maple is not in the news all the time, like ash or something else. Um, in this region, particularly starting around 2007, 2008, some really um, severe dieback was noted by a lot of the area foresters and particularly industry foresters. And it was hard for them to get anybody to kind of think that it was anything besides management that they were doing that was causing problems. And because of the high value of sugar maple, it's sort of the bread and butter of the industry around here, um, they were really concerned that, well, maybe it was management-induced dieback, and if so, they needed to do something different. Um, and so they came to us to sort of start uh, looking into this, and then the public National Forest Service and um, the DNR kind of came on board and said, okay, yeah, we need to examine this too, because after they started looking, we found it similar uh, severe dieback on public forest lands as well. So before I go any further, I want to do a couple definitions, and maybe Kevin will um, talk about some of this too, but uh, when you talk about dieback, it's really just uh, the loss of a crown due to some kind of single factor, um, usually attributed to something that lasts for a short amount of time and the tree's still living afterwards, um, or it, the tree can recover from dieback. Decline, though, which it's used interchangeably with dieback, but decline is really 
um, includes dieback as a symptom, but can also include reduced growth rates, so smaller tree rings. It can include um, loss of regeneration or lack of regeneration and loss of vigor. And eventually, the tree gets um, so many stresses that it, there's mortality in the tree and in the stand overall. So um, different factors could be anywhere on sort of the scale. It's a decline spiral. And you can see there's all different um, types of things might fall anywhere on that scale, like air pollution could be an inciting factor or a predisposing factor. Um, or it could be acidic deposition is kind of something, if it gets really heavy acid rain, that could be the contributing factor to leading to a tree's death. Um, so there's kind of a sliding scale of where these um, things could happen on the decline spiral. Uh, when we first started looking through or walking through these stands, some of them don't look so bad. There's still green leaves on the trees. They're still growing trees, although maybe not as fast as um, they should be expected. But when you're walking through, looking up at the canopies, you notice a lot of dead twigs of recently dead um, fine twigs and branches in the trees. There's uh, a lot of these branches that you can see here, these are not understory shaded out trees at the bottom of the canopy. These are up in the upper canopy where there should not be um, as many dead branches. Uh, you also, we found a lot of discoloration where um, trees were like in imminent decline where the, the leaves were gonna fall off later that summer. A lot of dead trees in the background. Um, also just uh, some of the stands, this stand in particular had been harvested uh, eight or so years before this picture was taken and all of the residual trees. It was not cut so heavily that they should have died, but they ended up dying really rapidly. Um, and there's a lot of dead snags. What sugar maple is there is not doing good at all. There's a lot of ironwood coming up in the understory, and um, which is a whole other problem for foresters. The and then in this particular site, there was no like really heavy rutting or um, any damage to the trees at the base that you could tell from equipment or anything. So it was really unclear as to what was causing this particular dieback episode or decline episode, whether whatever it was. If you look about um, sh sugar maple forest health in the Great Lakes region, dieback reports have been pretty intermittent since the 20s, but they're really scattered throughout the literature. Um, particularly in the Western Great Lakes region, there's very few inf far information out there. Um, in one research note from the Forest Service, I found a sentence that said that Duke's Experimental Forest in Marquette, Michigan, 28% of the sugar maple were impacted by dieback this year. And that was it. It didn't say anything else about how much they were impacted or what could be the possible reason why, or if there was anything else related with it. Um, some other thing that people might come across if they're looking at forest health in this region is Wisconsin maple blight. And there's still a fiddle out there for this that people find occasionally and ask, well, is it because of this? Um, the Wisconsin maple blight uh, happened in the late 50s. There was a um, seemingly rapid death of all the sugar maples in a really small area in northern Wisconsin, covered about two counties worth of area. Um, just a couple of years later, the, all the trees that had dead had seen, been impacted were dead, but then the regeneration was coming up underneath. So even though the, it happened so fast that it wasn't very carefully studied, the etiology or the cause was never specified, it was probably because of heavy defoliation and then really hard spring frosts that happened at a really small localized area. And um, that small area was able to recover. It wasn't something that um, prohibited sugar maple from occurring there, that place and location and time. If you look at um, where reports of sugar maple mortality and decline have come from, really since the 50s and 60s, this area in the Great Lakes, nothing else has happened since that time. Um, most of the research on sugar maple, as I said, has happened in the Northeast, so um, throughout Appalachia Corridor, um, Pennsylvania, New York, Vermont, and New Hampshire, um, much more research has been done in that area, looking at sugar maple health specifically. And what are some of the things that they found there, some of the causes or etiologies? It's been associated with pretty much anything, whatever they were looking for. So soil nutrition, soil moisture, extreme weather events, climate change. It's been associated with atmospheric deposition and a change in soil chemistry and highway salt, biotic organisms like defoliate and insect outbreaks, 
um, deer impact the regeneration, sugar maple borer, decay fungi, even management activities if the management is um, being too hard, uh, cutting trees. So it could be any one of those things. And that was kind of where I started from looking at uh, the plots that I did here was maybe which one of these things is it associated with. So the research objectives that I wanted to um, look at were, first of all, just evaluate the trends and dieback in this region. Um, is it steady or is it increasing or decreasing? And how much of it is out there? Is it only in these few stands that foresters are reporting or is it more widespread than that? What next wanted to sort of characterize the dieback and growth relationships. Is it just dieback or is there an actual decline going on in this region? If it's dieback, maybe it's periodic and the whatever factor is causing it will go away. If it's decline, it's probably something more serious. And then if possible, try to determine the etiology or the cause of that dieback. So what we did for uh, four years in a row, visited over 120 plots annually. Uh, these plots were identified by foresters. We tried to do um, paired plots so that on the same soil type and in the same relative climatic region, um, fairly close together, we tried to find a plot that a forester would say is unhealthy and a stand that they would say is pretty healthy, it's doing okay. So we had something to compare, very similar characteristics to see if we could find what characteristics were standing out as being different between them besides just the... Um, crown condition. So we did this across all varying levels of dieback, made sure the plots were away from the road so that highway salt didn't come out as something, um, and put in typical forest health plots on all the trees that were merchantable size. So we collected um, as much information as you can imagine could be collected um, relatively easily, looked at ownership, uh, management histories, and past cutting regimes, um, took as many crown and bowl biometric information as possible. So all the defects on the bowl, all the different crown variables and crown conditions that you can measure. Uh, I collected growth rings to be able to um, reconstruct climate conditions based on uh, NOAA Weather Service data. I collected forest floor condition, um, which also included the looking at the region and the herbaceous composition and all these plots. Um, did a small investigation of sap streak disease on the side, which if you don't know, sap streak is um, a fungi, uh, fungi that comes in um, primarily when the trees get wounded in some way at the base of the tree and it causes rapid um, death of the tree within a few years. Some it's increased or the likelihood of sap streak being a problem um, goes up when the trees are being actively managed, but uh, we did not find it any more than in natural stands that had not been cut in a really long time. So sap streak was not related to the dieback on any broad scale. And we also collected soil and foliage to look at um, nutrient analyses for all these trees. Out of all the things we measured, probably what people would be least familiar with is the forest floor condition. And it was a really simple scale that I kind of added last minute to the protocol of what we should measure just because it was such an easy thing to measure. I figured why not? And I just kind of threw it in. And it was just a one to five scale on evaluating the directly the forest floor without digging or collecting or doing anything else. So um, you can see the two pictures up here in a forest with a lot of bare mineral soil showing, a lot of sticks and twigs whoops, showing. Um, you can see oak leaves because all the maple leaves have been consumed. Uh, this is a one or two. There's probably a lot of actual earthworms present in this soil because they're the ones that are pulling down the fine litter and consuming it into the um, organic layer. The picture on the right here with the sugar maple region showing, it's really thick litter. There's no mineral soil showing. You could probably pick up that litter in a big thick chunk. That's something where there's probably no earthworms or very, very few, and um, it's not being impacted by them. So if you don't know, the Michigan has no native earthworms. They were all wiped out in the last ice age. So any sign or presence of earthworms, we know that those are all exotic invasive species. Looking at where all these plots were located, it was spread out uh, across the pirate and public ownership evenly, uh, and there were a little bit of regional differences, so most of the private industry land is up in this Keweenaw Peninsula, um, but the plots in Minnesota were on the same latitude. Um, and then 
when we looked at all of the data together, there was no significant statistical difference in sugar maple health or dieback between private and public lands during this study, during those four years. So what that meant is that um, based on ownership and management, there was no difference in um, the amount of sugar maple health. So right away, the industry folks who were supporting this were kind of happy that it came out that they themselves weren't causing it, but then that meant they still had no clue as to what was. When we looked at the amount of dieback over this region, it is pretty uh, spread out. We, you can tell we tried to find healthy and unhealthy plots in all areas, but not necessarily wasn't uh, successful all the way, all the time. Um, some areas had a lot more dieback than others, but we could find unhealthy stands pretty much anywhere you wanted to look. Uh, something to note in the literature, any kind of time that dieback is reported as more than an average of 10% dieback in a stand of trees, not just in individual trees, that stand is usually considered to be unhealthy. So that's usually when you see other literature, they're trying to compare healthy and unhealthy. Anything greater than 10%, that's typically the cutoff. The mean dieback in this region in this study was 12.5% over this time period, and it, there was some annual variation, but not significant in that it was a um, pretty steady trend. It wasn't really increasing, but it wasn't going away either during those four years. There were individual trees, however, that did rapidly die just within a short amount of time, so it was definitely an ongoing issue. Some of the things that we looked for right away were um, growth rates of trees. And this is a sugar maple basal area increment over the whole time study period. Ideally, this should be still increasing continuously on this graph. And since the 90s, it's sort of tapered off, which is not what you want if you're trying to grow bigger trees. Um, things that stuck out associated with growth right away um, were a lot of climate variables. So the mean total previous year snowfall and the days with snow greater than about an inch um, were really significant with growth rates. Uh, in this region, this is all data from NOAA Weather Service um, weather stations. The days with snow cover have been decreasing and the number of days with the maximum temperature below freezing have been decreasing, which you might think, oh, that's great. The growing season must be longer. Well, actually, it's um, causing a lot more freeze thaw damage to the trees because snow is such a good insulator. These trees are used to that heavy lake effect snow being on them for a long time and sort of protecting them from the climate extremes in the spring and the fall. So sort of losing that protection is making it more likelihood, the likelihood's increased that um, they're going to get some kind of damage to the roots or the buds or the leaves in the spring and the fall. Uh, without going into too much detail about it, we also found a lot of nutrient interactions that were specifically associated with growth reductions and the amount of dieback that was present. Um, if you remember back from your undergraduate degrees in soils class, um, there's a lot of antagonism and synergism that happens between specific nutrients. So if you have too much calcium, you might end up with a deficiency of magnesium, for instance. Um, in the case of the plots that we had here, the gray lines in these graphs are these little violin plots. This is the typical range of nutrients what sugar maple should have if it's healthy in the literature. And the black on these violin plots is the range that I had in the plots in the Great Lakes region. Um, the little tiny line is the average that I had, which is on the low end for a lot of these really important nutrients. And then there was plots that were way too low or way too high in certain nutrients. So there was a lot of specific interactions happening that were very site specific and soil specific to that soil type that the trees were on. Um, looking at what dieback was correlated with, I threw all the variables I could into a big stepwise linear regression model. The things that came out in these models uh, time and time again were the forest floor rating, so that measurement of earthworm impacts, soil carbon, soil manganese, and the herbaceous cover were all the things that were correlated directly or seemingly directly with um, the amount of dieback in the crowns. Uh, interestingly, soil carbon, manganese, and the herbaceous cover are also things that are impacted directly by presence of earthworms. 
So why is that? Well, what do earthworms do? Um, in a typical forest spodosol that we have here, um, there should be really distinct layers of your O, A, and E horizons where you have this lightly leached out layer. Um, most of the sugar maple roots are in the top layers with a really thick duff layer that's kind of spongy on top that's sort of acting as your mulch in your garden or your flower bed. It's keeping the moisture in the soil, it's um, protecting the roots from freeze and thaw events, and it's also um, keeping the temperatures sort of regulated in the soil and where the roots are. When earthworms come in, they sort of mix this all up in a big jumble mess, and they're pulling down all that mulch or all the leaf litter into the organic layers. And um, you lose the distinction between layers. The trees might sort of get a pulse of nutrients, but then all those nutrients that are left sort of rapidly decrease as the worms consistently eat any new litter that comes down. And um, you get a lack or a loss of regen, you get a loss of um, the herbaceous cover, a lot of other things sort of indirectly happen because of earthworms. Even though earthworms themselves aren't attacking or eating maple, um, their activities are causing harm. So if you kind of wanted to summarize sort of the reported dieback etiologies or put them into categories of things like climate change, acid deposition, air pollution, um, man-made factors like the altered hydrology from roads or harvesting and then biotic components, those are probably all in some way leading to reduction of growth and dieback and decline. And is there any connection between these factors and the maple in the western upper Great Lakes forest? And the answer is yes, sort of directly and indirectly. This is a really messy kind of slide to think about, but um, definitely saw issues with climate happening over the past few decades. Uh, nutrients were a factor and earthworms were factors in those models. They stood out time and again as being related to the amount of dieback that we were seeing. Well, uh, if you kind of think back to that decline spiral as to what, how could those things be predisposing or contributing or inciting factors, um, it's hard to put where those things fit on that decline spiral because earthworms also not only could impact the directly the reduction of growth in trees, but they can impact the nutrients in the soil, which could be something that was there poor to begin with, or maybe that was an inciting factor. It's, it's a very messy, complicated situation. But what managers need to keep in mind is that it's a different combination of different interactions that happen at different scales and locations. Not everywhere has earthworms, not everywhere has poor, poor soil. So you have to kind of keep in mind um, soil fertility and climate could are most likely the things that are predisposing trees to additional stress. Intensive forest management alters tree species density and diversity. So we already have probably more sugar maple in a lot of places than historical communities were, more of a mixed forest type. Basswood's not worth as much as sugar maple, so people don't promote it as much as sugar maple. Uh, high deer density, which is a problem in this region, impacts the region, which also deer can facilitate earthworm invasion. The worms in turn facilitate more invasive species and other things, plus expose the soil, plus um, disturb the moisture regimes and the temperature regimes and the nutrient cycling. Um, all the disturbed nutrients and the earthworms themselves impact the mycorrhizae on the trees. So you can see this is just kind of a spiral as um, decline is happening, but you don't have all of these factors at every single location. So managers have to be um, vigilant in what they're looking for. Uh, as far as how to deal with this kind of impact or these things happening, uh, site selection becomes critical. It, do you have so much dieback that it's you're not going to be able to do anything about it? Do you need to convert to something else? And managers need to be willing to convert in some cases. Um, Long-term single tree selection has been the dependable go-to bread and butter for a lot of uh, northern hardwoods management, but we know that it alters species diversity. And um, if you don't have regeneration of sugar maple coming up underneath your dying um, severely declining sugar maple, you're probably going to need to change or do some other prescription or expect that you're going to have a different species in the next few years. Um, 
What about trying out something new like canopy gaps or strip clear cuts or shelter woods? Um, sugar maple is not always tolerant of these, but maybe it'll help promote them or quickly release a cohort, get them up above deer. Um, a couple of different industry groups are doing this now in response to this research because they they see that there's not very much you can do about stopping earthworms or stopping climate change um, other than trying to actively manage for it um, by trying something else. So other things that you could do would be something like scarification or herbicides to help with some other invasive plant species maybe or promote tree regeneration. Um, you could fertilize in the forest, but there's issues over doing both of these things over the large scale. Costs a lot of money, takes a lot of time. You really need to get um, specialists involved. Uh, you don't want to go around messing with nutrients if they're already sort of on the um, edge of um, pushing trees into even further decline. So it's probably not going to happen over the large scale for a lot of the forest service land or these big TMOs and REITs over a lot of ownership that they have either. Um, there's invasive species, BMPs to consider. This goes for earthworms and like invasive seeds of things. Should always power wash equipment between sites or use as much local road grading material as possible. But even doing that, you still aren't always going to be able to stop the invasion of some of these things. Or they're already there. It doesn't really do much um, once they're there already. So the bottom line is that there are options available to kind of try to resolve these issues, but uncertainty still exists. Um, managers need to think outside the box, and really what we need is to continue monitoring the long-term silviculture experiments that um, continue these harvesting and growth trials. They were pretty big in like the 50s and 60s, kind of went out of fashion, um, but they, we need new ones in the face of changing climate, invasive species presence, uh, deer browse, earthworms, all of these factors need to be considered at the same time in these harvesting and growth trials, not just one factor or another. Um, if you have different environmental conditions from the historical, which we do, we have different climates, you could argue, and we have different soils potentially from acidic deposition. That's enough to alter your environmental condition. Um, we also have an altered biotic composition. We have either more sugar maple or less regen. There's something different in the amount of sugar maple that we have in a forest, and we have all these invasive species. So arguably, these are novel ecosystems that we're trying to manage. We don't have all the answers for, and the same exact management regimes that we've been doing for the last 80 plus decades aren't probably gonna work the same um, with these altered uh, conditions going on. So a lot of people helped out with this uh, research. It was very fast and furious, uh, 25 minutes here to talk to you guys, um, but funding was provided by the Forest Service, Michigan DNR and GMO uh, Renewable Resources. Feel free to contact me with any questions if we run out of time here today. I want to give Kevin plenty of time to talk, but Mark, if it's, if the, I didn't see if anybody shared anything, but um, just let me know. No questions at this time. Well, thanks. Uh, thanks for coming today. Thanks for having me today. I'm going to talk about evolving paradigms of Aspen ecology and management. And um, currently, I'm at the Teton Research Institute of the Teton Science Schools here in Jackson, Wyoming. Um, but most of the research I'm going to talk about was my doctoral work, which was um, primarily in the Sierra Nevada. So I'll start with that. I do present a little bit of data from um, the uh, Greater Yellowstone region, Jackson Hole area, at the end of the presentation. So look at that. Um, first off, some information that probably a lot of you know, but um, as way of introduction, um, we'll talk about the distribution of aspen. It's, it's the most widely distributed tree in North America, which is usually in the first paragraph of any paper you read on aspen. It has a wide distribution and a broad amplitude, you know, from, from um, sagebrush steppe to uh, montane and subalpine forest, even tree line and boreal forest in some areas. So uh, really broad amplitude and a wide distribution. Uh, a critically important tree, it's been, it's been claimed to be the most important deciduous tree in the western U.S. Um, biological diversity is, is probably the primary reason of its importance um, to managers, but uh, I want to point out a couple other things. As water becomes uh, more of a scarce resource, um, Aspen may take the front stage as, as having a higher water use efficiency than, than conifers. And, uh, and so a forest of, of Aspen will have uh, increased water delivery compared to conifers. It's fire resistant and resilient, which is likely going to 
has been important and will be important in the future. And then aesthetics for humans, uh, critically important um, aesthetics in mountain environments. Um, some current and future challenges uh, for the species itself, and, and again, we, we want to think about aspen as a foundational species that supports uh, a lot of uh, biodiversity. So I don't, I don't see this as kind of a single species um, focal uh, focal point, but but really looking at a foundation species. Um, some of the challenges it's had is. Um, drought in the early 2000s, uh, which, which likely caused a sudden aspen decline in 2007 to 2012 or so. Um, and in Colorado, Utah, succession to conifers is an issue in a lot of places where disturbances have been suppressed or um, reduced. And uh, the, as those as the cereal aspen age, uh, they succeed more to conifers and their vigor is reduced. And then climate change. Um, we're probably seeing some of this now and, and likely we'll see more in the future. Increased aridity, hydraulic stress for Aspen, um, and a migrating climate envelope that we'll take a closer look at here. So this is some uh, modeling work done by Rayfeld et al. 2009 paper. Um, disregard the difference between yellow and red pixels. Those are basically showing where the climate envelope in the western U.S. supports uh, Aspen distribution, and, and this is the current distribution. I'm going to fast forward 90 years. Here's 2030, here's 2060, and there's 2090. So I'll play that, I'll just go back and just, just play that again. The current distribution, 2030, 60, and 90. And we can kind of see the, the climate envelope for Aspen evaporate off the landscape there. And, and really this is, this is concerning because the future climate is predicted not to support the, uh, the extent of Aspen that we have today. And so uh, it's a conundrum for managers. What, what can be done or what should be done um, to uh, have Aspen persist on the landscape? And do we have any control over that? So that's, um, that's where I'm gonna focus uh, my talk and my research. And uh, but first, I wanna talk about uh, uh, some some opportunities for Aspen and then some changing paradigms for Aspen ecology. So some opportunities for Aspen in the future is that increased fire or fire severity, which is predicted in the future, may yield more Aspen cover in the future as, a, as an early cereal species, a species that's able to not only re-sprout but also take advantage of um, open, open growing space due to disturbances like fire. Aspen may benefit from increased fire. Increased conifer bark beetle outbreaks may favor aspen regeneration and growth in places where it's competing against conifers. But a couple of important caveats for either of these hypotheses to be correct, uh, the future climate will need to be suitable for, for aspen regeneration and growth. And this is a, a main point that uh, Dominic Kukowski makes in his uh, 2013 paper. So I'm just reiterating that. And then the importance of the relative contribution of uh, disturbance, which favors Aspen, versus climate or increased aridity, which may not favor Aspen, in the future is going to be vitally important for understanding changes uh, to this ecosystem. So some a, a, a quick word about the evolving paradigms on, on Aspen ecology, and I'll highlight some work from from some colleagues that, that really, I think, um, highlight how this paradigm is changing. The conventional wisdom, um, you know, in the, in the latter half of the 1900s was that aspen reproduction was all about suckers and that sexual reproduction was rare and unimportant, um, that the clones were very large and very old, um, in, in some cases that they've been claimed to be the largest organisms in the world, which may be true, or the oldest organisms, um, that there is low genetic diversity and that genetic diversity was likely unimportant in a, in a clonal species. And then there was a single successional pathway that Aspen was always uh, early serial and successional to later serial conifers. Now, if we look at the modern paradigm, and I'll highlight some research that shows some of these findings, sexual reproduction is more common than we thought. Um, genetic diversity is high and likely more important than has historically been thought. Uh, clones are smaller than what we, what we once thought, and that there's um, multiple aspen types and successional sequences, and I'll, I'll highlight some research showing this. First, about sexual reproduction. Historically, it's been uh, understood as exceedingly rare. This is a quote from, from a paper. Under the marginal conditions that prevail in some regions, aspen can consistently reproduce only vegetatively. And that, that really was the predominant paradigm for many, many years. Um, but as we look for aspen sexual reproduction, as, as, as um, people have been out there combing the landscape for aspen seedlings, uh, they've been found. And this is just a list that I've created. I'm sure it's not uh, including everything, but um, these are all the different um, 
identifications of Aspen seed, successful Aspen seedling establishment. Um, you'll notice all of them are black except this one blue one. The black are those where Aspen seedlings have been found after severe fires, and, and that's the predominantly what, where people are finding them. But this 2007 paper by Landhauser et al. They or 2007 occurrence, the paper was in 2010, this was after a clear cut in Alberta. And so again, a significant disturbance that left bare mineral soil, and they found Aspen seedlings in areas where Aspen did not exist before the clear cut. But all the other examples I list there are wildfires, and specifically in high severity patches of wildfires. When we look at Aspen genetic diversity, this is the work of um, Karen Mock and, and Duke Woody um, and, and their colleagues. And a really interesting work that they've done to, to, to really um, look at the genetics of, of Aspen in some large clones in Utah. And then this was repeated in the Southern Cascades. But they sampled Aspen stems on a 50 meter grid um, in, in an aerial extent, about 23,000 acres. They, they sampled over 812 stems. And they found a lot more genetic diversity than they expected. They found 195 different clones. Uh, most of the genets or clones were small in size. Uh, this has been replicated in the Southern Cascades by Duke Woody. And establishment from seed is likely more common and, and important than historically assumed, as, as evidenced by the number of clones that are out there. And the clones may not be as ancient as one is once assumed, though, though certainly they're still very old. Uh, they may not be as old as, as we once thought. And then, um, Again, this is Karen Mock's work and um, some work by DeRose et al. Um, when, they, when they dug deeper into the, the genome of, uh, or really the genetics of Aspen, they found that you know, Aspen is one, a plant that can have triploidy, or basically three copies of each chromosome. And, uh, and what they found is that the largest clones uh, were triploid and a higher proportion of western Aspen south of the last glacial maximum, which is shown uh, by this blue line here. That's the last glacial maximum. So if you look south of that in the western US, uh, a much higher proportion of the stands that they sampled uh, had triploid clones, meaning the, the clones had three copies of each chromosome, shown here uh, by this kind of conspicuous chromosome that showed three copies there, whereas the diploid had two. Um, this has some really important implications for, um, for Aspen ecology and management. Triploid plants um, grow faster, as in, has been shown by DeRose et al. In, in 2014, they looked at annual increments and showed that triploid aspen actually do grow faster. Um, they could be sterile or have greatly reduced fertility, so this may have implications for sexual reproduction. And they have bigger cell sizes, which may influence physiology, and especially water transport or the likelihood of cavitation, which has been shown to be really the, the primary causal factor of that. Aspen decline or sudden Aspen decline in, in Utah and Colorado in uh, you know two, 2008 to 2012. Kevin, we've got a couple of um, questions in Q and A. If we if is it okay to take a break and look at sure. those? Sure. Yeah, so uh, Douglas Stewart asks. He says, uh, "Interesting. How how is fishing game controlling the deer populations?" Okay, and I don't know, you know, I don't know when you asked that question or what part of my presentation that is about, but certainly I will mention that um, ungulate herbivory, both both wild ungulates like like deer or elk or um, domesticated ungulates as cattle and sheep have been shown to be really important um, in, in whether or not aspen regeneration is able to escape browse site and really grow into a tree form rather than a shrubby uh, over browsed form. And so. Um, I don't talk a lot about it in this presentation, but I do need to say um, that ungulate herbivory is a really important um, disturbance to Aspen. And uh, if if we do have a wildfire or some regeneration or even management action that's regenerating Aspen, if, if there's high uh, browse pressure, browse certainly needs to be controlled. And uh, you know the best way is fencing, but it's it's laborious and expensive. Um, but there have been other methods that have been explored um, with some success. So browsing is certainly a big issue. Um, so, Douglas, I don't know um, which which slide your question was on. Actually, I was going to say, yeah, he did, Doug just oh, that question was for Tara. Okay. It's, I said it was for Tara, so we'll, All right, well, it, we'll it give her a to, take. It we'll, applied to Aspen as well, so uh, okay. maybe we can bounce back to, to Tara. Zach, uh, Zach Roberts asked, uh, did, does the increase in habitat in current areas open up other areas not inhabited by Aspen to be prime for Aspen habitat? Let's see, does Creason have that in current areas? Yeah, so, so I think if that map uh, extended further north, maybe we would see the opening of some climate, climate envelope that migrates northward into, into Canada that may support Aspen that, that didn't support Aspen in the, in the past. So I think there is some trade-offs, but when we look at the western U.S., it's, it's definitely a, 
a decline in, in the climate envelope space that will support Aspen as we move forward in, in, uh, in time. And then again, that's a modeling exercise. Uh, okay, so thanks, Douglas. Uh, all right, so I, I don't see any other open questions, so I will continue, but please ask your questions as I go along, and, um, and hopefully we'll, we'll bounce back to Tara then to answer that question that was put to her. Um, this slide here is about um, functional types and successional sequences. This is Paul Rogers and his, and his colleagues' work, and they really wanted to, with this paper, make it explicit that not all Aspen stands are serial. In other words, um, some Aspen stands are stable, and over time we don't see succession in conifers, specifically in the Canadian parklands and the Colorado Plateau, indicated there by kind of brown and yellow uh, color on the map. Um, those, those are often stable stands, and those are the large um, large stands where you don't see conifers encroaching, and they seem to, um, to self-replace even, even without disturbance. And so that's just an interesting caveat that not all stands are serial and that we need to understand the, the successional kind of history of the stand in order to, to manage it well. Okay, and moving on here. So, so now I'll, I'll um, transition to talking about some of my research, and um, I'm kind of uh, framing it as an adaptive management of quaking aspen, and I've split my, my research questions up into these three categories. Resistance, uh, which is um, forestalling impacts to, to uh, existing stands, so trying to resist change in stands uh, due to climate change or succession or, or other factors. Resilience, um, which returns to desired conditions after a disturbance. What's the resilience of a stand that experiences wildfire, for instance? And then response, managing to accommodate change or migration. And these are three categories kind of outlined by Millar et al. in their 2007 paper. And I'll use them here to, to frame the question. So first, in, in the resistance category, how effective are current aspirin revitalization treatments? And specifically, I'm talking about conifer removal and prescribed fire. I'll show you some data on that. How do these treatments compare to wildfire? So I compared those treatments to wildfire in different severity classes. I'll show you that data shortly. And then resilience, how to stand composition and fire severity impact post-fire aspirin response? Let's take a look at some of the data. First, the study sites, this is California, this is Lake Tahoe and Mono Lake. Um, we have conifer removal sites, we have four sites, three in Virginia Creek and one up at Sugar Pond Point. We have two, uh, three areas of prescribed fire, two at the Green Creek site and one at Burton Creek State Park. And then four wildfire sites uh, where wildfires burned uh, in a variety of severities and we'll take a look at that data. So the Aspen restoration treatments, this is a pre and post conifer removal. This is the same site, uh, pre conifer removal. This is post removal. So you can see quite, quite a lot of the basal area of logical pine was taken out of that stand. And then this is a prescribed fire burning through an Aspen stand in the Eastern Sierra Nevada. Fire severity, stand composition, and aspen regeneration. These two pictures do a real nice job of summarizing what we found for fire severity. This is the same fire area, Silver Creek fire in 2008 in the Eastern Sierras. On the left is, is a low severity burn patch where the, the, the conifers were not killed by the fire, a lot of the aspen were killed, and the regeneration response is kind of low density aspen with kind of a low growth rate. Again, this is two years after the fire in both these photos. On the right hand side, a high severity patch um, where, where all uh, pre-existing vegetation was, was killed, and you can see the response of aspen, high density suckers and really um, fast growth rates compared to the low, lower severity site. And so in general, we found that greater disturbance intensity yields increased aspen regeneration response. And, and here's a graph that shows that. I'll kind of start at the bottom. The orange line uh, is the untreated controls for um, you know, crew treatment year up to five years after fire. The purple line are conifer removal sites where you can see a bump in regeneration. It, it, it's different than, significantly greater than the controls two years and then continues at a slow trajectory up to five years is where we have data. Uh, so that's when you don't kill over story trees. You get a response, but it's slower. The prescribed fire here is this maroon line showing kind of a bump up um, two years after the fire, and it gives about the bang of the buck of a low severity fire, which is shown here in green. Moderate severity fire is shown in blue, uh, which is a higher uh, 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 density of ramets, and then high severity fire there is shown in red. And um, these trends are, are for density, but then when we, when we looked at growth rates in the fire severity class, we found um, similar findings that not only are, is the high severity fire uh, having a higher density of, of regeneration, but those, those ramets are growing faster than even the lower density regeneration in the low, low fire severity areas. 
Um, when we made a generalized linear model to look at, we reconstructed the stand condition before the fires, and when we looked at causal factors that could um, affect aspen regeneration after the disturbance, we found some, some important factors here. Uh, one being the burn severity, as I just showed you, the higher the burn severity, the, the greater the uh, density and greater growth rates. Also, the aspen basal area killed by the fire. So the, 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 the amount of aspen that was there and the amount of aspen that was top killed by the fire uh, was important and, and increased the density of ramets afterwards. So these blue ones, burn severity and aspen basal area killed by fire, they increased ramet density after a disturbance. These orange ones that I'll talk about next, as they increase, uh, they reduced the aspen density uh, of regeneration. So rocks and thousand hour fuels, thousand hour fuels tend to scorch the, the ground and kill the, the roots, heat kill the roots even underground. And then rock just reduces the, the extent where aspen can come up. The aspen basal area dead before the fire, as we found more basal area that was dead before the fire, that reduced the regeneration response. And, and what this shows me is that as the stand declines above ground, it's also declining below ground. And, and as the aspen stems start to die above ground, that reduces the ability of the roots to re-sprout after a disturbance. And then likewise, with the conifer basal area alive before the fire, the more encroached the stand was before the fire, the reduced response it had after the fire. So as conifers come into the stand, that's going to cause stand to decline and um, reduce its regeneration response after a disturbance. And that this model in, in total explained 52% of the deviance in our data. And this is from um, a paper in 2015. Uh, moving on, we'll look at some response strategies. So um, when and, and where will new aspen stands established naturally or managed? What forms of human-assisted migration are, are most successful? And is it likely that aspen will successfully migrate via seed? So let's look at some of these questions. Uh, establishing new stand or genet, if we wanted to move aspen around, how could we do it? We could outplant seedlings or clones. I'm not going to talk about that. We could transplant. We could have natural post-fire seedling establishment, or we could um, we could disperse seeds to suitable environments after a disturbance. And I'll talk about those three here. So first, um, quickly, because I don't have a lot of time left, uh, ramet transplantation. We did this kind of experiment where we, we transplanted, there was a, a one of our collaborators, the, the um, Tahoe Conservancy, wanted some aspen in a burned riparian area that didn't have aspen prior to the Angora fire in 2007. So we transplanted some ramets from a burn stand uh, very close to where, the, where uh, their site was, a burn stand that was vigorously regenerated here, you can see on the left, and then a stand that was outside the burned area that, um, that hadn't been burned, but had some regeneration in the understory. We, we took similarly sized ramets from each of those sites and transplanted them to a new area. And here you can see one of the plugs that we transplanted here from the burn site, and then this is where we transplanted to, a small little creek in the burned area. And we found a um, significant difference between the source of the transplant material and the survival rate. So the burn source, we had a 95 survival rate three years after the fire. Very few of them died and they were, they were doing pretty well. But when we took them from an unburned stand, uh, we found that 50% of them died uh, within three years. And, and when, we, when we did some destructive sampling to get it, some, some reasons for this, and there's, there's significant difference there. Uh, we destructively sampled and looked at the underground resources and found that the root to shoot ratios were, were different for these um, different transplant sources. So in the burn source, we had a much uh, significantly different or much higher fine root to shoot ratio. They had a lot of fine roots. They were growing uh, without the help of overstory trees to support them, and they were gathering ample water and soil resources with a lot of fine roots. Whereas um, the large root to shoot ratio was much greater in the unburned source. And, and those were larger roots that connected to overstory trees. And those, those uh, saplings or young trees were likely being supported by carbo carbohydrates and water from the parent, parent trees or overstory trees in those stands. So this indicates to us that a post-fire environment may yield some, um, some good material for transplantation if that's um, what management wants to do. Just to look at another study that looked at uh, kind of a common garden experiment with aspen, I just want to point out this top one where the growth rate of aspen source material from this green area did better further north than even the local material or any of the other provinces. So we're seeing some indication that, um, that we need to maybe think about moving um, uh, genetics around to places that are going to be more appropriate for those genetics given uh, global climate change. 
natural post disturbance seedling establishments. So as part of this research working in recently burned areas with Aspen, we found a number of sites that had Aspen seedlings. Here's a couple of them that we dug up. And then we tagged 125 of them to just follow their um, survival and growth over time. And the three year survival rate in three sites that we looked at was 90, 90%, 88%, and then 0% in a site that had established in a kind of seasonal pond that um, in subsequent years kind of got drowned by that pond refilling. But in the sites that didn't get drowned, we, we found a fairly high survival rate, at least in the first three years, which means seedling reproduction is going on and likely will be important in the future. This is the last thing I'll talk about. We also looked at just kind of taking some seeds from Aspen and distributing them to some sites to see what would happen if we just put some seeds out and get them to establish. We gathered seeds from unburned female clone two years after the fire. Just anecdotally, there was abundant seed one year after the fire, but, but many fewer seeds two years after the fire. And we think this is maybe due to smoke stimulation of seed production, which has been an observation that I've made and some others have made, but has not been critically tested. Be interested in doing that. We scattered 30 seeds in little half meter uh, micro plots in four sites um, next to where we found natural seeding, so we know it's conducive to seeding establishment. And uh, we pulled competing vegetation. We did this two years after the fire. Um, we got some germination three months afterwards, 16 to 50 percent of the seeds germinated. One year survival rate was zero to seven percent, so pretty low. And encroachment by competing vegetation was really the prime reason that we found that, that the aspen didn't survive. They, they just don't have a high competitive ability. We think that maybe if we propagate them one year after the fire, shortly after the disturbance, that maybe we would have had a higher survival rate. I just throw that out there as, as an idea that uh, I'd like to look into further. And then a broader aspen fire landscape. This is some more local work. And again, this is just kind of a back of the envelope calculation I did for a field trip that an aspen working group had uh, up in the Jackson Hole area. We looked at the Bridge of Teton National Forest and Grand Teton National Park, and I basically delineated all the aspen cover, which is shown there in either green or red. Green are unburned stands, and red are stands that have burned in the last 84 years, or basically in the contemporary record from 1931 to 2012, which is where we have pretty reliable fire polygons. And what we found is that there's about 4 million acres of forested landscape. About 200,000 of that are um, acres of aspen. That's about 5% forest cover. Um, and the total aspen burned in that 84-year period was, was about 27,000 acres, which is about 14.3% of the aspen cover. If we look at the fire rotation period for this, it, that leaves a fire rotation period of about 587 years for aspen, which, which indicates to me that there's kind of a lack of disturbance on this landscape. Aspen is not likely to wait around 600 years for a disturbance. And so we need to think about um, uh, reinstating disturbance regimes and trying to get disturbance back on the landscape to, um, to really facilitate the variety of, of microsites and the mosaic of forests that, that we want to have out there. When we looked at Aspen ages in the Grand Teton area, the, the overstory trees, we found the mean age to be 109 years, which again is kind of old for an Aspen stand. And it does show that, uh, that a lot of the stands in, in this area are, are aging. So in summary, um, there's a lot, a lot in this presentation and I went through it quickly, so I'd be happy to entertain questions, but increased fire and fire severity, conifer bark beetle may benefit Aspen in the future. Increased aridity and drought will likely challenge current Aspen populations. The importance uh, uh, of the relative contribution of disturbance versus climate in the future is going to be vitally important for really understanding Aspen's trajectory. And active management to restore current stands and establish new stands will likely be critically important for long-term persistence of Aspen uh, in the Western U.S. and elsewhere. Some future research that I'd like to just throw out there is some baseline Aspen inventory and monitoring. Surprisingly, more needs to happen there, We're looking at bigger mortality, age, regeneration, browse pressure, conifer succession, polyploidy, post-fire seedling establishment, something I'm interested in, and just documenting post-fire restoration, planting, and seed dispersion, impact of smoke on seed production, um, species migration, natural or human-assisted, uh, long-term efficacy of prescribed fire, natural fire, and actually being in Jackson Hole, which is kind of the birthplace of prescribed fire for Aspen, we're looking at some long-term trends in that area. And um, Aspen cover change in the last century. We have some historical maps that uh, mapped Aspen extent in the early 1900s, late 1800s, and we like to examine those for Aspen cover change over time. With that, I'm going to say thank you. Thanks for attending. I want to thank the many collaborators and funders of this research, and uh, I'd be happy to take questions. Thanks, Kevin. We've got one question. Doug Stewart asked, uh, how big a role do you feel aspens play in the biodiversity of the areas you studied? 
Yeah, I mean, I think I think they they play a great role. They're they're really they're really the the only or the major upland deciduous tree um, in this area. Certainly, we have some oaks in, in California, but uh, they play a much they they provide a much different habitat type. Um, than the neighboring conifers, and, and you just go walking into an aspen stand and looking at the understory uh, vegetative diversity, looking at the, the, the invertebrates, the, the birds, the small mammals, the large mammals, there's a lot of biodiversity that's attracted to aspen stands that maybe can survive in conifers, um, and there's probably few species that are aspen obligates, um, but there, there are many that use aspen stands preferentially, and, and if we were to lose that aspen cover, I think uh, some of the biodiversity that it supports would, would likely decline as well. Good. Okay, uh, real quick uh, note, folks. I'm going to, uh, Tara, we have a question for, for you that someone asked earlier. But before we do that, for our the, uh, attendees, I'm going to launch a poll that hopefully you should, uh, you should see now. Uh, while Tara is answering this question, please take a moment and answer those questions inside that poll. So, Tara, uh, while you're away, Doug had asked, uh, how is fish and game controlling the deer populations. Yeah, so I just wrote back a sentence or two about it. The Michigan DNR, um, you know, they put out statewide deer surveys every year and um, throughout the 90s it was really, the deer populations were really heavily increasing and then they kind of took a sharp turn for the worse and started declining, particularly in the UP um, since around 2000. And uh, yeah, that's right. I'm, I just finished giving a webinar. It's not awesome. <laughs> So there's no um, statewide push by the DNR to decrease deer. They actually really want to keep deer populations high because a lot of hunters want to keep deer populations high. And um, even in areas where there's a lot of um, regeneration problems and things like that with uh, forest trees, there's still a lot of political discussion about deer populations. And um, anytime any of the hunting permits or anything like that are increased, so you get a whole... Um, political uproar about it. Um, I'm not a deer expert by any means, but there's plenty of people around here. If you wanted to talk more about deer and wolves or anything like that, that could answer questions. Okay, anyone else? Any more questions? Megan, do you have anything you need to share or to wrap up? Yeah, um, I just wanted to remind folks to mark their calendars for next month's webinar. Um, and I'd also like to just extend a thanks to Tara and Kevin um, for taking time. Our internet connection seems to be a little unstable. So I'll just repeat, um, our next month's webinar will be on Wednesday, May 11th. Um, we're going to have Dr. Ed Gilman from the University of Florida. He's going to be talking about um, tree pruning. So please mark your calendar for Wednesday, May 11th. And again, I'd just like to extend a thank you to Tara and Kevin um, for taking time out today to um, give their talks. And the webinar will be on our YouTube in the chat pod. So if you'd like to um, link to this uh, or rewatch the webinar, feel free to do so. Okay, I think that's it. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Megan and Mark. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, Kevin. Thanks, Tara. Have a good day. Thank you.